Hello, I'm Alexander Pothalusen, uh, lead developer of Scala plugin for IntelliJ IDEA. So as I implemented uh, the second analyzer for Scala, I know a lot about implicits. So today I want to share with you some of this knowledge. So uh, what I want to share with you is uh, how implicits works, how implicit search exactly works in uh, compiler, uh, how sometimes IntelliJ IDEA can help you with them, and small possibilities to improve performance uh, with of compilations and IDE responsiveness uh, when you are using implicits. So let's start to talk about implicits. I know you're all familiar with uh, Scala and of course with implicit so you know that implicit is divided into two s big sections uh, parameters and conversions and conversions is a bit simpler than parameters so we'll start from them and they also are divided into two uh, type conversions and extension methods uh, these uh, two things uh, differ are different for purpose, I mean that uh, extension methods, methods is very popular pu purpose in different languages like C Sharp or Kotlin, uh, and type conversions is less popular purpose, and actually in Scala is also much less popular. So usually people want to use extension methods. But we will start from type conversions as it's a bit simpler. So I'm really sure that you know about this feature in Scala, so, but for the full reference, I'll show you uh, what is it exactly. So here you can see a simple example where we have uh, B to A definition with P parameters and return type A. So we have two classes, uh, A and B, and uh, the last line contains some weird uh, declaration, value A of type A, and we giving to them new B. So for the most compilers, it won't compile. But in Scala, Scala compiler will start to search for implicit conversions from type B to A. Uh, I, here I mean functional type B to A. So as you know, every definition, uh, it's like a value with functional type. And even more, if it's this function has uh, some implicit parameter sections, then for this function, implicit parameter section will be ignored. So as for parameters, I'll talk about a bit later. So let's continue about conversions. So how implicit search works exactly? Uh, implicit search uh, is divided into two scopes. Uh, the first search is in resolve scope. Uh, it means that what exactly is available uh, in current scope. So if we can write this name uh, in the code and code will compile, then it's our resolve scope. So it's divided into declared implicits, imported implicits, and implicitly imported implicits. Implicitly means from the same package uh, or from the pre-DF uh, class of Scala. Um, all of these places are, have the same priority. Different priority has extended scope. So if we uh, can't find anything in resolve scope, we will start search something in extended scope. Extended scope means companion objects of parts of our search type. So our search type is some function type from B to A. So, uh, and we are looking for all parts of this type, and we are looking for all companion objects of these parts. Here it's simple, it's parts is B and A, so we are looking for companion objects for A and companion objects for B, and we, we are looking into these companion objects. So if this companion object contains some implicit conversions, so compiler is able to find them because we are looking for, for type B to A. Uh, so let's take a look for example because it's much simpler to understand uh, on some example. So here we can see uh, child type and uh, class type. We have conversion from child to type 
And uh, here we can see that compiler is able to find this conversion. So why? Uh, our uh, parse is child and type. Uh, so uh, both of them don't have any uh, companion objects. But uh, we are looking also into base classes. So child has base class named container, and container has uh, companion object containing the simplest conversion. So compiler is able to find the simplest conversion because of this. Actually, this algorithm is even more recursive. So we can, for example, add here class T, T of Y, and class D, which extends, sorry, extends container. And then we will replace it to T of D. So here, the compiler is still able to find this implicit conversion. So why? Uh, initially, our parts was child and uh, and type. Then we take a look. We we can take a look for a base class, which is T of D, and we we still looking into parts. Parts is T and D, and D also has some base uh, class container, which exactly has companion object container. So this uh, extended scope is really huge, and uh, it gives us uh, powerful possibilities to create some DSLs, which even don't require you to add import statement to use this implicit conversion. So uh, we looked into how implicit search works, but what if few implicits were found? Here is some example, and this is a question for you. Uh, and you can take a look for this example more attentively. So uh, here we have class base and with companion object base, uh, which has implicit conversion from class to string. And also we have class which extends base, and companion object class which has uh, implicit conversion from base to string. So here we have declaration uh, string, and new class. So who thinks that uh, the first implicit conversion will be picked by compiler, class to string? Not much. Uh, who thinks that base to string will be picked up by? Uh, who thinks about the third option? The third option is that it will not compile. And actually, that's true. It will not compile. Uh, let's take a look for this. OK, you can see uh, IntelliJ is smart enough to find that it, it will not compile. Uh, but what's the reasons for, for that? If we, find, if we found few implicit conversions, then we are looking for two rules uh, to solve this ambiguity. The first rule uh, is about location of implicit conversion. So if implicit conversion is located in, the, uh, in inherited place, then this is our, our implicit conversion. So here, uh, what, what means by inherited? It means that uh, companion classes of this object are inherited one from each from other. So here, you can see that base to string is our implicit conversion. But we also have the second rule. The second rule is, means that uh, the more specific implicit conversion is should be picked by uh, by compiler. More specific means that uh, it, it picked for more specific type. Here we can take a look that class is more specific type than base because it's inherited from base. <coughs> so our implicit conversion should be class to string. So if these two rules uh, don't match, uh, then it's ambiguity error. So what about performance? Uh, we just uh, understood uh, the whole algorithm of implicit search. Uh, so imagine the situation when all implicit are in the same resolve scope. So for example, you have a big object 
uh, and all implicit objects, uh, all implicit definitions are put into this object. Uh, so the first problem is that it's harder to debug problems when sometimes wrong implicit is chosen. And the second one is complexity to find uh, for compiler, uh, because uh, compiler still requires to uh, check all implicit conversions. So if we have them all in one place, uh, then for every implicit conversion, we need, we need to check all of these implicit uh, functions. So complexity is multiplication of number of implicit places to number of implicit conversions. So you can see that it's, it's slow. And uh, there is no any possibilities to fix that, I mean, in, in compiler, uh, I mean uh, algorithm, because uh, <coughs> it's a basic algorithm of implicit search. But uh, we sometimes can do something to uh, simplify things for compiler. So what we can do, we can use extension, extended scope as much as possible. Uh, what I mean, then when we need implicit search for type B, for example, then only in this case we can take a look for companion object B and find uh, related to type B implicit conversions. Uh, <coughs> so it encapsulates uh, this implicit uh, for, for this type B only. And the second possibility is to try to split implicit by priority. Uh, you, you, you remember the first rule about <coughs> uh, solving ambiguity. So if you have uh, implicit located in some object, uh, then this implicit has bigger priority over implicit based in, based in base trait of, for this object. So if compiler can find something in this object, then he probably will not need to take a look in this base trait. So when you have, for example, five uh, related to type B uh, implicit conversions, uh, and few of them are m much more popular in your project, then probably other three would be good to put into base trait. So you can split them and uh, a compiler will search over these two, find the applicable one, and will not search um, other three implicit conversion. So a few words about explicit return time. Uh, who thinks that this code is okay? Here we have uh, class A, class B, and method to int which requires b, and we pass this to this method new a, so it requires simplest conversion. Who thinks it's okay to do that? Few, few people. And uh, who thinks that it's some problem here? What kind of problem do you think? We, we don't have explicit return type that, that's located in the <coughs> capture of this uh, slide. So what exactly happens here? The problem is that if implicit conversion don't have uh, uh, explicit return type, then in body it can also contain some implicit. So it probably to calculate uh, to infer type of this implicit conversion, we need to search some other implicits. In this case, we can get some possible recursions or uh, or uh, some exponential algorithms searching these implicits. So, in, uh, for for these cases, compiler can say that uh, <coughs> if implicit located in the same file without explicit return file. It should be defined before our place. So we, we, to fix this file, we, we can move just uh, our implicit conversion up uh, than, uh, <coughs> than our implicit uh, conversion place. And actually, it's a better idea to uh, use type inferences at case. So 
the simpler it would be to just to define this return time, and IntelliJ suggests you to do that. So let's continue with extension methods. It's also a very known thing, so we can add methods to existing types. It's uh, a very popular feature. So this is a basic example where we have class type and class type ext, which contains method foo. So when we have uh, extension, uh, a com implicit conversion from our type into type ext, then compiler is able to find this implicit conversion and to find then this method foo. So how it works? Uh, full algorithm. So first, initially, we need to find this method full without any implicit conversion. And if we found something, that's, that's all. We don't need implicit conversions completely. But if we found uh, some methods with the same name full, but all of them are not applicable, then we need to search for implicit conversions. And we need to find such implicit conversion which adds this applicable type. It means that uh, type after conversion contains this method with, which is applicable. And if we found few implicit conversions, we need to choose the most specific of them. Uh, so there are few important things about this algorithm. The first, the first one, if we found something which is not applicable in the first part of algorithm, then we can't use implicits for arcs. So let's take a look for example. Uh, this is commented, but if I uncomment you, you will see that uh, it's, it wasn't found. The reason is that method foo is located here, but type is not applicable. So here we have type T of type type, and T type is not int, so it's it's not okay to pick up this foo. But then we are looking for implicit conversion from type to type ext, and type ext contains method foo uh, with argument type ext. Uh, and of course we we can convert this T into type ext, so it should be okay. But compile in algorithm is compile. Uh, doesn't allow this because of possible exponential problems here when we need to search too much implicit conversions. Uh, so to fix that, we need to change type X into type, though we have exact type here, or we can just comment the first full and we, it's still okay because now uh, for arguments we can use implicit conversions. So this type also implicitly converted into type X. And the second important thing is that we can't choose a more specific method among methods uh, from different implicit conversions. So what I mean? We have two conversions from type into type X1 and type X2. And both of them gives us uh, method foo, but the first one with type E and the second with type D, which, which is base class for E. And now, if, you, if we, we are trying to pass new E, it's not okay. Because, uh, because of different implicit conversions. We can choose uh, more specific implicit conversions, but as they are same, uh, there is no more specific of them. So we have ambiguity error. So to fix it, we can put uh, these two methods with the same name into one class. Then we, we got uh, exact implicit conversion. And among these two full methods, we can choose a more specific one. Or the second possibility will just remove one of these methods. So it also will be okay. But uh, generally, when you need extension methods, you just need implicit classes. So an implicit class is just syntax sugar, uh, which converts into a class and appropriate implicit conversion from uh, our type into this class. 
but it's uh, much more clear to see this implicit class uh, than writing some uh, complicated implicit conversions into some types. So how IntelliJ IDEA can you help you with, uh, with implicit uh, with extension methods? So imagine a situation when you have extension class, uh, implicit class, which extends string and adds method twice. Twice just uh, has concatenation of our string. So we know in our project that we have this uh, implicit extension method. But this extension method requires uh, some import statement. And we probably don't know which import statement we need to add. So in IntelliJ you can just invoke second completion and we can put twice. And when we invoke it, uh, extension method will be added, uh, extension import will be added automatically. So we don't need even uh, know about where, where is located this uh, implicit extension method actually. And the last thing about uh, implicit conversions is magnet pattern. Magnet pattern is, was initially described in spray our blog, uh, so you can read more about it here. And as one of the exa examples where it is used is spray roads. Uh, the main reason why we need to use it is, is just more powerful uh, overloading resolution. So if we need uh, to, for example, two sum methods, first of parameter is a list, uh, and the second parameter is, for example, uh, map. Uh, so we, ne we need to sum, uh, to map elements of this list and then sum results. And the second way is to filter. Uh, so we, we want to filter elements of this list and then sum results. And this is not possible to overload uh, just in Scala. So just write method sum with two parameters and another method sum with another two parameters. That's because uh, function uh, has the same type after type erasure. So uh, we can't just change boolean and int. In the GVM, it will have the same signature. So uh, we can solve it by using magnet pattern. And magnet pattern uh, requires uh, you to add only single parameter with uh, type sum magnet. And then in companion object of this sum magnet, we can add few implicit conversions for for all our overloadings. So now we can just invoke uh, our overloading and uh, this uh, overloading will be converted into sum magnet and then uh, this sum magnet contains method apply which will be invoked. So it's, it's quite simple but this is pattern which is used for uh, better overloading resolution. Of course it has some problems. Uh, for example, for anonymous function we now need to define uh, par parameter type explicitly. That's because compiler is not able to understand which type is here. And the second possible problem is parameter info. Now uh, in IDE we have only parameter info uh, that it's just some magnet. And we don't know what is behind of this parameter. As a prototype, I developed uh, in IntelliJ a special build which contains support for such parameter info. Here, if method foo, we have uh, two overloadings with R and foo magnet. And both of these uses magnet pattern. So first of them, for example, uh, requires int or list of t. And the second requires string or string to string. So here we have a lot of possibilities to path something into foo. But here we know only about r and foo magnet. And in IntelliJ we can just invoke parameter in foo and now you can see uh, additional possibilities about integer, list of string or another two possibilities here. So it's not yet released, but I hope it will be released in the next major version of Scala plugin. 
So let's continue with implicit parameters. Uh, compiler is able to fill some missing implicit parameter list for developer. So here you can see some method definition full with one implicit parameter list. So this method full requires implicit int. And we define this implicit int and we, now we can invoke this full without any parameters. And compiler will fix it for you. Uh, one of the main features uh, which is new comparing to implicit conversions is uh, recursiveness. So for example, we can define class ordering uh, and we can define implicit value of type ordering of int and then we can define a list ordering of t which requires ordering for this type t and it returns ordering of list of t. So it's for example when we know how to order lists um, lexicographically. Uh, if, so if it, and it's possible only if type t is also possible to order. So this requirement is very important for us. Uh, so now if you need uh, ordering of list of int, compiler will be able to fill it for you because implicit parameter search will be recursive. So how it works generally? Uh, generally implicit parameter search is completely the same as implicit conversions. Uh, just the type uh, will be not functional, it will be just type of this implicit parameter. So let's take a look about recursiveness. Uh, here example about two implicit definition. A requires string and returns int and B requires int and returns string. So you, if we implement implicit search very simple then uh, we, we will get stack overflow error as uh, we will add implicit parameters recursively one by one and it will not finish in. But compiler, of course, is able to stop this recursion. So how it? Uh, initially, we can think that if we, we are looking for the same uh, implicit parameter, we can just break uh, this search. So I mean that we, we, we are looking for int, then we found b, then we are looking for string, we found a, and then we are again uh, looking for int, and b is prohibited here, probably. I mean, uh, but this is wrong because, uh, for example, another example when we have A which returns a list of T and requires T, B which returns option of T, of T and requires T, and final implicit value string. So now we can combine it uh, in any direction. I mean, you can add any number of lists here. So like a list of option of list of string. And compiler is able to find implicit for you here. Uh, so we can use A twice. So our initial uh, guess was wrong actually. So how it exactly works. Uh, we need to define two things. First is complexity of type. Complexity is just number of parts of this type. So for example, list of int complexity is just two because parts is list and int. And the second type, second example is sequence of int and option of string. Complexity is definitely four because number of parts is four, sequence, int, option, and string. Actually, it's a bit uh, more complicated, uh, but uh, in the simple way, you can just you calculate number of uh, words in your type. And the second thing uh, is top level class. Top level is, you can uh, understand it by uh, getting the first word. So for the first case, it's just list, and the first, the, the second example is just sequence. So how compiler uh, is avoiding stack overflow error? Uh, it has a list of s types which we are searching now. And we will not add new search for some new type in two cases. The first one, if list contains some equivalent type. So if we search uh, somewhere in our recursion for string, then we will not search for string again. 
because it definitely means uh, stack overflow somewhere late. And the second thing is uh, when list contains some type with the same top level class, so first for list, we are looking again for list, but complexity of new type is bigger. So in this case, if we use this rule, it doesn't mean that this rule is completely right. It just means uh, that this rule gives us possibility to stop recursion when it probably uh, can give us stack overflow error. So if complexity grows, then a compiler is able to stop it. So for example, if we, if we search for list of int, then we can't search for list of list of int because it means that we will probably search for list of list of list of int and, and so on. So that's the main idea how to stop this recursion. And the one more important thing about implicit parameters is local type inference. So this is not about example, it's not about implicit conversions and implicit, it's just about uh, type inference for generic type parameters. Here we have a function foo or with parameters t and t to string. It's very common situation, uh, but this is won't compile because for uh, string, for s we will not be able to understand that uh, this is string. That's because uh, Scala compiler uh, tries to solve uh, generic parameters for whole parameter list. And that's the main idea how we can solve this. We can split it in, into two parameter lists and how, for example, it was solved for fold left method, for example. Uh, so in the first parameter list we found that t is string and then here we can, uh, compiler is able to understand for that for parameter s type is string. So is it the same for implicit parameters? Let's take a look for some example. Uh, here we have class A of T and class B of T and S. And we also have method foo with two parameters, T and S. And it requires A of T and B of T and S. So this situation is very similar. Uh, first uh, contains some information about T and the second uh, contains both T and S. And our implicit is A of int and B, B with generic parameter of T and T. So uh, how exactly type inference works uh, for implicit parameters? It considers every implicit parameter as full impl parameter list. So after search, every search, we, if we found some any information about generic parameters, we use it in the second search. So here we found A of end and we found that t is actually int. So in search for b, we, we will use t as int. And uh, then we will, we will uh, get information about s. So foo is actually has type int. This is one of important features of IntelliJ IDEA when you can uh, get information about any uh, expression type. Uh, okay, but what's the problem here? Problem is that if you want to pass these uh, implicit parameters explicitly, it will not compile. Here, uh, actually, uh, IntelliJ is not smart enough, uh, so we need to invoke compiler to get this compiler error. That's because uh, here we are trying to solve uh, our uh, our generics for whole uh, implicit uh, for whole parameter list, and it's not the same uh, as for implicit parameters. But for implicit parameters, it's really powerful as we can use uh, found information in the second parameter, uh, in the second implicit parameter search. And a lot of projects, a lot of DSL uses it, it of course. So if everything is okay, then it's, it's great. We don't uh, think about it a lot. 
But if something is wrong, I mean then if compiler uh, is not able to compile because of some ambiguity or it can't find uh, any implicit conversion, or even worse, if uh, some t at some point uh, recursive implicit parameters uh, can't be added recursively, then it's really hard to uh, debug these problems to get uh, our code compiled. The first possibility is, for example, to use some uh, compiler uh, keys like xprint type. But it requires some additional skill, skills to read these log files. In IntelliJ, we have two features to analyze implicit conversions and parameters. The first one is about implicit conversions. Uh, so, for example, we have A, which uh, and foo is added by uh, implicit conversion. We have two implicit conversions, A to C, which adds foo, and A to B, which adds also foo. But as, as we uh, learned here, uh, we have object implicit, which extends from low priority implicit. This is a very common pattern, actually. And uh, this uh, A to C implicit conversion will have bigger priority over A, A to B. So foo will be chosen from C. And in IntelliJ, we can follow this. Okay, sorry, this is too low. Uh, okay, we can follow this, and IntelliJ shows you ex 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 really chosen uh, implicit conversion. Uh, but if it's, it's wrong in IntelliJ, you can also uh, make it explicit. So if you really wanted A to B, so we can take a look into this uh, action and choose proper one. And the second thing is about implicit parameters. So uh, in IntelliJ you can analyze recursive implicit parameters even if some implicit parameters were not found. And, but the only problem uh, when implicit conversions uh, uses some implicit parameters, it, it, it will not be catched by IntelliJ ID. You need to put these implicit conversions explicitly and then analyze implicit parameters. Uh, there's a small restriction which will be probably fixed in future. So here we have uh, method foo uh, with, which requires type A and uh, we have two implicits. Uh, for type A, we have uh, implicit which requires B, and in B, we have implicit which for this B. So it's a recursive example. We can invoke this action, uh, and you can see that uh, A is, was found, and for A, we found B. But what if we com comment some of these implicit conversion. Then uh, we can see that parameter wasn't found here. And the, we can take a look for reasons, reason for that. Reason here is that no, there is no applicable uh, by type implicit. And the second possibility is, for example, to comment another implicit conversion. Then here we can see that parameter is still not found, but there is applicable A with type A, and the reason for A that there is no uh, implicit parameter for, for this method. We can take a look, track it down, and we will find that for, for type B, there is no applicable implicit for that. So this is really powerful when you have some problems with implicit parameters. So now you know uh, a lot about implicits uh, and it's really important feature of uh, Scala language. Uh, people use it for writing DSLs to, to extend some types and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, as you know a lot of uh, problems or hidden things about implicits, you now can use it safely. And of course, you you can you choose right tools like. 
So thank you. That's all in Belarusian, please. Any questions? Okay. What uh, case structures? Ah, key shortcuts. Oh, okay, I'll tell you more than just key, key shortcuts. Uh, in Intelligy, uh, you can find uh, go to action. Action. Uh, this action has a shortcut Command Shift A for Mac and Control Shift A for Windows. And when you invoke it, you can type name of this action. In our case, we can just try implicit. Then we can find implicit conversion action and implicit parameter action. Here you can find uh, shortcuts for that, and also you can just press enter and invoke it. But this is not applicable just for implicit. Uh, so you can search any action if you just don't remember keyboard shortcut for that, for example. Okay. Uh, do you see implicits more as a net positive, uh, having worked with it so much, or more of a distraction? Uh, I didn't. Like, do you think it's good for Scala ultimately or bad? I think uh, it's good because it's base feature of Scala, which makes Scala Scala. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't. I can't imagine Scala without implicits. Generally, of course, it it makes some problems with performance, but without implicit, we we will not see such features like type classes, uh, DSLs, and so on. Type level programming completely depends on implicit. Uh, what's the difference between implicit class and implicit object? Actually, implicit class is just syntax sugar which adds implicit, uh, I can show you here, for example, implicit, uh, implicit class A of a string. So, A, A. It's just syntax sugar where we, we need to remove this implicit keyword and add implicit definition from type S into this type AA. This, this is just imp uh, syntax sugar, so implicit class uh, doesn't mean more. And moreover, because of this, you can't uh, write implicit classes on top level of file, just because of this. And implicit object is actually, implicit object is uh, for example, and is also some kind of syntax sugar. Sugar, you can imagine it like object, and then we can put implicit value and with uh, this n. So this is different things a bit, but you can just understand uh, this after changing it into uh, constructions without implicit class or implicit object. No more questions? Or one? Okay. Uh, the main problem is, uh, so question is uh, why not to highlight here uh, that uh, it will not compile after that. Uh, here is uh, full where IntelliJ knows that implicit parameter is not found. So the problem here is that in IntelliJ, uh, our analyzer is still uh, not uh, the same like Scala compiler. So we have some problems with, uh, so we have some red uh, code in, in which is compilable. So, uh, and we are working on that to remove all these uh, places to make uh, uh, developer feelings better. Uh, 
So adding some more distractions probably would be a bad idea. So I think that we will fix even a bit more of problems with red code, and after that we will add. To add it, it requires probably a few hours of work. But uh, after that, uh, probably people will be distracted too much because of that. Probably. Or probably currently not. I don't know, but I, I just want to make sure that our analyzer will be a bit better than it is now. Okay, so thank you.